Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. We are having an excellent conversation today. Joining me on the podcast is Jason Newfeld, and I hope I got that right. You did. Oh, yay. I'm really terrible with names, and I didn't have him pronounce it before I unpaused, so (laughs) running a risk. He is an attorney, an elder law attorney in the Mm -hmm. great state of Florida, and we are discussing how to get Medicaid to pay for all the things we need to pay without draining your bank account first. Is that a correct assessment? Yeah, I think that's right. Thank you, Jennifer. First of all, thank you very much for having me. It's really nice to be here. And yeah, Medicaid, it's all about, the, the, the principle is, you know, if you are ultra wealthy, you can well afford to pay for everything that you need. If you're impoverished, you may already qualify for Medicaid that will pay for health care, long-term care, home health care, nursing home care, all these things that are very, very expensive. And it's everybody in the middle who's getting the short end of the stick, right? So Medicaid planning is all about working with people who don't yet qualify. And then we have our legal and ethical ways of protecting what they have so they qualify for these benefits so they don't have to impoverish themselves first. Yeah, not only do we get the short end of the stick, I think they smack us around with it. Yeah, yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Thankfully, my parents' home was paid for, mm-hmm. and my dad had a good retirement, and he had investments. Yeah. So we rented out my mom's home, and let's see. So between the rental income, her Social Security, and an infusion from their financial planner into her into the trust bank account, right. she had plenty of money. Great. Yeah. To it's, live yeah, on. Yeah. Ob- yeah. When you can. When you can live off of your investments and it's different sources of income, that is, of course, the best. If you can do that, it's always better to do that as a, if, you can, if you can avoid having to do all these craziness to qualify for Medicaid. Certainly, I say cash is always better than anything. There's no restrictions on it. You, can be, you know, everyone takes it, right? It's uh, <laughs> certainly that's terrific. It's a really nice position to be in. And I didn't have to try to deal with that system. So. Yeah. Yeah. Gratitudes for that one. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, mom. Thanks, dad. Appreciate it. You know? Yep. Definitely. And, you know, I don't know how familiar you are with the Prop 13 where they they basically took a sledgehammer to a tiny tax problem mm-hmm. back in the 70s. It's just not done, not done good things for our state. But basically, a paid for home under Prop 13 taxes, you know, we paid the gardener, the homeowners of insurance, mm-hmm. and one other thing, the property taxes. Right. And she had plenty of money. That's great. She would have had plenty of money for a very long time. So yes, I was very grateful that my dad was very frugal and hoarded it all. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that worked out in the end. It did? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So where should people start if they are in the middle and they don't have a house they can rent out? Yeah. Like we did. Right. Yeah. I mean, so it depends on where they are in life. So if they're um, young like you and uh, and, you know, they have some time before they are going to need these long term care services. I also tell people I go, it's good to talk to a trusted financial planner who can help you um, look into long term care insurance, because similarly, long term care insurance is just as good as cash, just as good as having cash. The problem with it is most people, when they look into it, they see how incredibly expensive it is. So that's not an option for everybody. And in addition, once you are of a certain age or you have certain ailments, you just won't qualify no matter how much money you have. They just go, we're not going to underwrite you because you, you are of a certain age or because you have these conditions. And so, you know, these insurance companies, that's what they're all about. We don't want to avoid paying out whenever possible. Um, so usually my clients come to me when they are in their late 60s, 70s, 80s, or or even later. And um, most typically, it's because there has been a deterioration in their health. Sometimes it's sudden, like right after a heart attack or a stroke. Sometimes it's more gradual, like with dementia, right? You don't start, it's not one day you're lucid and the next day you're out of it. It's a slow progression. And they realize they can't, for whatever reason, they can't do for themselves anymore independently. They need help typically in one of three scenarios. It's paying for care at home, 
It's going to an assisted living facility where, you know, you're in like your own apartment, but you're near all the services or that highest level of care is nursing home or skilled nursing facility care. And then what they quickly realize is that those things are very expensive and Medicare, what we all get when we turn 65 and we've paid into the system, which you get regardless of your, you know, regardless of what you have. Um, has a very limited long-term care benefit. People go, I have the best Medicare plan ever, so I'm all set. No, thank you, Jason. I don't need you. And I go, well, uh, you know, take a closer look at that plan because 0% of them cover um, more than 100 days in a nursing home or will cover any bit of an assisted living facility that's non-medical or they won't, and they won't cover home health care to help you cook and clean and go to the bathroom and get dressed and shower and, 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 and all, all, all these sorts of things. Medicaid does. So they'll come to me and they'll have, typically they may or may not own their house. And on top of that, they'll have between 50 and say $750,000. And they've done a calculation. They go, even with, you know, let's say they have a quarter million dollars. Well, if you're in a nursing home that costs $11,000 a month, that goes real quick. That's not, that sounds like a lot of money, but it winds up not being that much when you have all these long-term care expenses. So they come to me when they have that realization. And then we go through with them the, there's there's more than one way to skin the cat. There We have different, you know, they all have pros and cons, right? Which is why having the cash to begin with is great. Having long-term care insurance to begin with is great. But when people come to me, we're, we're going to be able to protect probably about 70 to 80% of their assets, which is great because they think they're going to lose everything, but we're going to protect most of what they have through different strategies. And then we will legally and ethically qualify them for Medicaid to kick in and pay for some or all of their long-term care needs. That's excellent. Yeah. Because, you know, as, as we've read most likely in the news, the top 1% have a lot of income protecting, I don't want to say loopholes, but strategies Mm -hmm. legal. Yeah. And you know, the majority of this country does not. So it's nice to hear. Hear about a few. So yeah, well, where? You know, go ahead. You know what's interesting? What's interesting is I get this as a like a negative as to what I do. People go, "What do you mean you take someone who has quarter million dollars? I know you're you're hiding it. Isn't that stealing from the government? Isn't that you know that's not patriotic? That's un American." And I go, "Well, let's think about it this way. If you were in the one percent and you had ten million dollars in your bank account, what you would do?" is you would go to a tax planning attorney and you would say, I would like to pay as little in taxes as possible. I want to do it legally. I don't want to do anything that's going to, you know, get the, get me in trouble with the IRS, but what can I do to pay as little, as little as possible? As I tell people, I'm doing the same thing, except I'm doing it for working class, middle class, upper middle class folks who have much more to lose, right? When I save my clients a couple, you know, 50, 100, a couple hundred thousand dollars, I would argue it is significantly greater impact on their quality of life than when the tax attorney saves the guy with $10 million a couple million, right? So uh, I feel very proud about what I do. And again, I don't hide anything from anyone. I tell the government exactly what it is that I'm doing with, with my clients' income and assets and why still, under state and federal law, they have to grant my clients access to these benefits. So my dad would have loved you. His yeah. theory with yeah. he with the IRS was everything is deductible right up until the audit. Yeah, and we had we had a family business together. Yeah. His poodle, mm-hmm. both of them, because over the years there were two different ones. Yeah, came with him, and he wrote off the grooming, which if uh-huh. you're familiar with poodles, is not cheap because yeah. they got fussy hair to deal with. <laughs> and I think he wrote off the vet and the food, like the whole, all the expenses for the dog. He wrote wow. them off wow. because the dog was a mascot of the business. Okay. I'm like, yeah. now if I tried that with my golden retrievers, <laughs> who I referred to as spokes dogs, uh-huh. offline, I told Jason about my CPA attorney person and he wouldn't do it. Uh-huh. <laughs> he's uh-huh. he's a little more conservative. So right. it right. and it's fine. I I'll pay for my own dogs. But that was Fair my dad's enough. theory. Right. Yeah, there like you know, I don't have them just for a tax write off. That's right. That's funny. 
Although, you know, n- now that my daughter is nearly 30, I'm like, could we have had that child tax credit when I was younger? And she was, t- you know, a kid. And But it's okay. That's right. Moving you, moving on. You're doing now, all right. You're, you're doing yeah, all right. Yeah, I, I, could, I could be doing a lot worse right now. My there husband's in real estate. So. Okay. Oh, <laughs> he must be doing great. <laughs> yeah, he's a lot busier than he'd like to be. But, yeah. you know, it's it's one of those things where it's like, you got to make hay while the sun shines. Yeah, do it. Absolutely. I, I did tell Jason I live in a suburb of San Francisco that grows corn and cherries, amongst <laughs> other things. But that's our two top crops. Very nice. There we go. You could tell I'm not a farmer. <laughs> it's like, right. to find the word crop. So <laughs> where would somebody, let's say, our situation was my dad ended up in the hospital. And after bouncing my mom around for three weeks, he was in the mm-hmm. hospital for 32 days. Mm-hmm. You don't bounce somebody with Alzheimer's, advanced right. Alzheimer's around like that for three weeks and not suffer. Right. All of us were suffering from right. having to do that. So we, and then the hospital is like, they were basically 110% done with my dad. They're like, there's nothing more we can do. Mm-hmm. We're releasing him. Like, no, you're not. I didn't know this was happening and uh, I don't have anything in place. I literally had to find home health aids overnight. Yep. Not not the best scenario. And I, no, I do yep. counsel very stressful. people. Very yeah, stressful. it was not fun. Well, you have to make a dis, you know, a very important decision on the fly. Right. Not not how I it's how most of us end up doing it, but not the way I recommend. That's true. So the in home health care was twenty eight dollars an hour when it mm-hmm. was the two of them, which, mm-hmm. you know, simple math was over seven hundred dollars a day. And then after he died, we moved my mom into memory care. So thankfully my husband was smart enough to talk to my parents' financial planner and let him know what was going on. Yep. And because everybody knew everybody, right? He he helped facilitate getting bills paid and and all that because the my sister and I and our families could not afford seven hundred dollars a day for more than a few right. days. So where would we have started knowing? I mean, he came home yeah. on hospice, so right. we knew what was happening. Right. Yeah. A lot of people start with their financial planner. I get a lot of referrals from different financial planners. Hopefully they know. I say my biggest problem as an elder law attorney who focuses on Medicaid planning is that a lot of people don't know that what I do exists. That's why I love doing shows like yours. I'm trying to really get the word out that um, even if you're not in Florida, there's, for example, Um, anywhere in the United States, you can go to what's called the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys website. That's N-A-E-L-A, it's the acronym, .org. And you can click on find an attorney. You just literally put on your zip, in your zip code and we give you a list of attorneys. And I say there's no, there aren't any elder law attorneys worth their salt who are not a part of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. So that would be a great first place to start. Um, again, oftentimes it's the finan- if the financial planner knows that Medicaid planning exists, then they're great. Because a lot of people, that's, you know, the natural reaction is you go to your financial plan, you go, <laughs> you know what, how am I going to afford this? And some of them who are less educated are going to go, well, we're going to put you into a conservative investment and then we're going to stretch it out as long as we can. And we'll get you for another couple of months or a couple of years. Those who are in the know hopefully have a relationship with an elder law attorney that they trust and go, OK, we need to we need to do more than just stretch out your current investments. We need to do some real asset protection. That's really what it is that I do. It's asset protection just for you know, you know middle class folks. So those are two great places, the financial advisor, or if they don't know, you know, if they're not telling you that they know what elder law is or what Medicaid planning is, you go to the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys and you find someone who's experienced in, in doing Medicaid planning. That's really with the, the key words, because not many people have heard of that. They know estate planning, they've heard of elder law, but Medicaid planning is really the key term that your listeners are going to want to look out for. That's also really good to know. Yeah. And write that down so I don't forget. Mm-hmm. Since mm-hmm. I don't need to use it and it's Yeah. Okay. I did write it down right because being in California, yeah. like I said, it's not called Medicaid around here. <laughs> right. Medicaid that's right. I guess Medi-Cal planning attorney. Yeah, we, and we work with um it's a smaller percentage, but we do have people who and it's typically it's um, it's for folks really like you who have seen a relative go through this experience and knows how expensive it is. People who, if they have the wherewithal and they want to think about these things, they go to an elder law attorney well before they need these services because we have some asset protection 
um, strategies that we can use only if we have five years in advance to plan, which is great. We have most of my clients don't have five years; they need it tomorrow or you know next month. So, yes, so we have or a yesterday whole, exactly, or a whole suite of other services that we use. But the folks who have the wherewithal to, you know, gosh, I saw what my mom and dad went through, and I don't want to go through that or put my kids through that. We'll go see an elder law attorney sooner and say, listen, what can we do to protect my stuff now? So, because I know dementia runs in my family. I know Parkinson's runs in my family. What what are we going to do to make sure that my long-term care needs are taken care of? And I, I tell people, you know, I do some general estate planning as well, right? The wills, the trust, the powers of attorney. And I tell people, you know, of all the fancy revocable, irrevocable, special needs trusts and, you know, advanced plan that I do, there's no more important document than I can provide one of my clients than a well-drafted, durable power of attorney. Because if you wait until your loved one has lost their ability to make decisions for themselves, now, instead of them giving their spouse or child or trusted loved one the ability to help them make decisions, now we're going to court, which is a lot more expensive and more time consuming. In California, I think it's conservatorship. In Florida, it's called guardianship, where we're going to a guardianship judge and we're saying, listen, you know, Mrs. Smith did not plan in advance. We need to start making decisions for her, but she can't do it anymore. Um, so we're getting a judge involved, which is unfortunate because if you just came went to an attorney sooner, you could have bypassed that. The other issue that I want people to look out for is people want to, you know, they want to be penny wise and pound foolish by downloading these free <laughs> power of attorney forms off the internet. And what always happens with that is those forms are going to be good for certain issues and they will not work with others. For example, the free forms I see over the internet are usually fine for things like banking, right? They'll give you the ability to go access bank accounts and, and that's important. And that's something you got to pay, help your loved one pay bills and that's, that, that's useful. But when it comes time for more advanced Medicaid planning, they're always lacking. And so people go, Jason, don't worry. I got this power of attorney form. I did it years ago. And I look at it and there's the, you know, there, it's funny. In Florida, there's like the same three free forms I see over and over again. So I just have to glance at it and I go, nope, that's not going to work for what we need to do because it just doesn't give you the ability. It's not specific enough with what we need to do. And you can't do general, you can't just say, I give Jennifer the ability to do everything for me. So help me God. And that's the end of it. You can't do that. They have to be very specific. And if it's not in there, you can't do it. And certain states have specific laws like Florida, where if even if it's there in black and white, if it's not initialed properly, you can't do it. So there are all the, you know, people think that they're being um, crafty by downloading this free form. And I don't need to pay a lawyer money to do that. And I go, well, you know, you're really... Gam you're, if you're a gambler, you know, I get it, but uh, this doesn't seem like the type of thing you want to gamble with. Well, I'm going to refer my friends mm -hmm. to the Neela.org because they are in their early 60s looking at retirement. One's retiring mm -hmm. this year, one's retiring next year, and they've looked into long term care insurance. And at their age, and there's minor health issues, nothing yeah. significant. Yeah. That they would have to pay $50,000 buy-in for each of them. Yeah. So yeah. they have decided to quote unquote self-insure. Right. And I so see sounds, that a lot. Yeah. As I say, it's, you know, and they've yeah. got, they've had good jobs all the yeah. years. They've got, yeah. they've got good assets. As far as I know, I don't, I, you know, don't open their bank statements or anything, right, right, but right, right. Um, they've, they've done fine. They've got three kids mm -hmm. Two, one is married, one is engaged. Yeah. And the youngest one is, you know, 25 and starting his life. So, you know, they've got family to consider. Yeah. But this sounds like they have the time. Yeah. Hopefully the five year period window to plan ahead mm -hmm. so that maybe they can take care, you know, help take care of themselves without burdening their children right. and their, well, they have one grandchild. I'm assuming more will happen. Right. <laughs> and I'll give you, I'll, I'll give your listeners another long-term care insurance tip, which is, you know, I, you know, and we looked into these traditional long-term care policies. My wife and I looked into it and we're both, thank God, in excellent health. Um, my wife's a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. We're doing all right. 
And I and when we look at these traditional policies, I go, who is paying these premiums? This is ridiculous. It's crazy. Um, uh, and it, we we said we're not we're not doing that. Um, but what we did do is you can buy life insurance with a long term care rider, and that is a much more affordable and still very useful way to plan for to get long term care insurance. When you look at these traditional policies, which are ridiculously priced, you can get this life insurance. So what I like about it is we have this life insurance. And I have kids and I go, someone's going to use this policy, right? It's either going to be me because I need the long-term care or my wife or kids if I happen to go before I need long-term care. So I like it no matter what happens, someone's benefiting from this insurance. So it seems like a um, uh, a nice a, a nice sense of security for my family. So, you know, it's good to ask about, hey, if, if we can't afford a long-term care insurance straight up, let's look at these life insurance policies with these long-term care riders. See, now I, our insurance agent is a friend and mm-hmm. I did not know of those plans. There you go. So I will there have to I will have to go harass them there and go. pet their golden retriever. <laughs> <laughs> cute. They have their their golden goes to their office. Oh, so cute. okay, so we're oh, we're at the my dad's on hospice. Mm-hmm. We've got mm-hmm. in-home mm-hmm. caregivers at 700 plus dollars a day cuz this yeah. was 4 years ago. Mm-hmm. And now and we know we're going to put mom into memory care. But Perhaps they didn't have the investments, which paid about 25% of her expenses. So now we're having to figure out where this 25% is coming from. Yeah. And we're like, uh. Right. So you're (laughs) talking, hopefully then you're going, you're talking to an elder law attorney and they're going to go through with you the different ways. Again, everything I tell people, we, we do a consultation because there's more than one way to do it. And there's none of them are a magic wand. It's not like I just have this great trust that I can just throw all your money into that has no negative repercussions. Everything has a drawback to it. So we're typically not doing one strategy. We're putting together a collection of strategies to balance out depending on my client's circumstances and what's best for them and their family. It's, it's diff- a little bit different for everybody. Don't lose hope because there's a way to do it. And it's all, you know, it's all with an eye towards putting more money in my client's pocket, giving them access to resources they wouldn't have had access to otherwise. So whether it's completely stopping the financial bleeding or whether it's at least slowing it down significantly, it's all a benefit. So it's like, it's a, you know, my, my joke is it's a very easy sale because I tell people, you know, everyone, when they I explain to them what it is that I can do. I get checks and hugs because they're like, they think they're going to lose everything or nearly everything. And I go, no, 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 we're going to be able to save most of this stuff. And here's how we're going to do it. And here's the timeline. And they're just so happy. So it's a really nice, it's a really fulfilling area of law. I got to tell you, it's a really nice uh, to be able to help. We are able to help a lot of families this way. We're very grateful for people like you. Mm -hmm. So do you have like some generalities you can tell people like which directions you might look at for them? Obviously this is not. This is so, not blanket advice for right. everybody because he just said it was you have to assess yeah. everybody's yeah everything's things different. It's it's hard it's hard to give a specific example for a few reasons. Like so, for example, in Florida, some of the strategy that we use here won't work in California because Medicaid. Um, we, this is actually good for people to know. Medicaid, while it's a state and federal partnership, but it doesn't transfer. So if you have Medicaid in California, if you move to Florida, you don't automatically get Medicaid in Florida. You have to reapply and there are different standards. So you may not you may qualify for Medicaid in one state, but not qualify in another. And similarly, so I tell people, you know, if so for, for your listeners purposes, if they have a relative in Florida or they're thinking about moving to Florida uh, hopefully they'll call me or someone like me in Florida. But if they, in any other state, they got to deal with someone in that state because I don't know the particularities of California law. I really don't. Um, I'm only licensed to practice in Florida, so that's that that's what I that's what I focus on. So they really, I'm hesitant to even get into some of our strategy because people may go, oh, that's a great idea, but it may be inapplicable, not applicable to to wherever they are. But really, it is it is going to be so worth their while to go pay for an hour of a lawyer's time to sit down, go through their specific circumstances to get a plan for what they can do. What I do is I charge a consultation fee, but if they hire me, it's a credit toward whatever they hire me to do. So I'm just trying to, you know, get tire kickers, you know, the, 
to, to, to get rid of that. But everybody walks out of one of my consultations significantly more educated than when they walked in. And even if they don't hire me because they don't need me or because, you know, they're maybe they're moving to another state, they're always very thankful that they they now understand what is a very confusing process. Yeah, definitely. I have learned more about Medicaid slash, well, mostly Medicaid because yeah. I haven't talked to an elder law attorney for the show. Mm hmm. And that's based in California. I have talked to them for my own use. Uh -huh. We did our financial trust and all yeah. that good stuff last summer. Good for you. Just so people know, it really isn't that big a deal. Mm -hmm. And we have one daughter and we do have a family history of dementia. And my daughter has a chronic illness. It's mm -hmm. not life threatening or anything, but, you know. Yeah. So when the attorney said, oh, you want everything to go to your daughter. Okay, right. great. What happens if she goes first? Right. And I right. looked at him and I went, well, that's just an awful question. Right. What a good one. Let me think on that one. Yeah, she doesn't no, have a fiance, but they're not, you know, they're not married. And my husband and I are just old enough to be a little old school. And it was like, hmm. huh, do we give it all to him or like what? <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's really important because that's where um, Medicaid planning and estate planning really intersect. You know, we, we deal with people who have special needs children. Or maybe they're not special needs now. Maybe, God forbid, you know, a son or a daughter gets into a car accident and becomes disabled, and now they need to qualify for these benefits. Well, we never want to be in a situation where mom and dad's assets are now negative because now it, once mom and dad pass away, son or daughter is getting an inheritance, and we don't want it to now jeopardize their access to benefits. So part of estate planning is 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 not only dealing with this. So I, I've families with special needs children who know that they need to protect them from this sort of thing. But it's even useful because we build it into our trust packages where I say estate planning is a lot like overpacking for a vacation. We put a lot of stuff in there that you may not need, but if you do need it, you're so glad that it's there, right? So we put stuff like that in there that basically says, God forbid your daughter were to become disabled in the future, then this your trust is going to protect her. And similarly, what if she gets divorced? Maybe you don't want her husband having access to half of your stuff, right? Maybe right. we want to make sure that we keep it in the trust so it's for her use. And if they get divorced, he can't touch it. It's not part of their marital assets, right? Normally he'd get 50% of her stuff, not if it's properly in a properly drafted trust that your attorney's done. So these are also things that we're thinking. And again, you're right. We all think that the circle of life is going to be parents die before their children. That's how it normally happens. That's how we hope it happens. But it doesn't always work out that way. So the trusts are providing for these multiple contingencies. What if it doesn't work out the way we plan? We can build in there what's supposed to happen, what your intention is to happen. Yep. Which is mm -hmm. now, now I got to ask my husband, double check a question yeah. that you brought up, which is <laughs> fine. <laughs> But, you know, and that's all good. And 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 the gentleman is in our Rotary Club. Good. So, you yeah. know, it's it's a good relationship. But, Terrific. you know, like you were saying, the circle of life, my dad passed away four years before his mom. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, and that was tough on her. He was the oldest son and she recently passed. And, you know, it's kind of interesting because my dad's parents did have quite a bit of money. They didn't mm -hmm. when they first got married, but my mm -hmm. grandfather was real good at making it and keeping it okay nice <laughs> and i got a lot of interesting stories about how he kept it but that's okay that's for a different podcast probably <laughs> uh, let's just say his uh poor upbringing never left him and i'm yeah, kind of the yeah. same way i'm very frugal but right. you know i enjoy i enjoy life so I, i'm not suffering from Good. my frugality Good. but they gifted money to my mm -hmm. dad and his two brothers mm -hmm. regularly mm -hmm. so that when my grandmother passed away i was like oh i see she gave away most of the money before she died okay that's right. cool yeah and you know that's fine you know i've never been one of those people that expected an inheritance right it's not my money so whatever i got if i got five bucks great if i didn't sure. fine it wasn't my money to begin with so it was really interesting to kind of after the fact see what their machinations were, because I'm a, right. I know, because my dad gifted my daughter money. She ended up in college for five years, yep. which was typical of where she went. But okay, nobody nobody bothered to tell us that the federal student loans only covered four years. 
Ah, so that was kind of okay. an abrupt slap in the face right, right at the beginning of the fifth year. It's right. like, wait a minute, what? Well, hopefully, hopefully that gift made a little bit of a difference. Oh, it did. Um, right. It paid for the whole year. Oh, excellent. Um, oh, that and worked it was out perfectly. The, it, yeah, and it was the exact amount of money you could gift somebody for the year and right. not incur them incurring right. any taxes. Right. So it was really interesting to see that financial planning, how it played out in Absolutely. the long run. Excellent. But what else should people... Okay, so we're going to the nela.org, which yep. is going to be in the show notes. Yep. What else should people be... You know, If you're taking care of a loved one, is there things that we should be considering doing for them? And then we're going to... After you answer that question, we'll go on to what we should be doing for ourselves. So... Yeah. I mean, if what people should be doing for their loved one is you want to, you know, part of talking to an elder law attorney is learning about resources. There's lots of resources out there. It's just so hard to find them. So I also advocate getting involved in um, the disease supported organization, the Alzheimer's Association, the Parkinson's Association. Uh, everyone has their support group and, and, and find a support group because A, I think it's important not to suffer in silence because there is a, um, a problem of caregivers predeceasing the ones that they are taking care of because the stress is all on them and they have the weight on their shoulders. So go finding a caregiver support group is great because it's all, not only is you, are you going to feel better for you know, the, 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 the catharsis, but you're going to hear from other people how they have found access to different resources. So that is absolutely uh, essential. Uh, also when they, you know, when they, their elder law attorney will talk about this, but when you access Medicaid, you're not just accessing the long-term care. They have other resources they provide to you. Like in Florida, Medicaid will pay for home adaptability and safety, um, equipment to be installed in the house, right? Like, uh, making the bathroom safer and non-slippery and the grab bars and the, the wheelchair lifts and all these sorts of things, which is really, really important. It will also provide respite care for the caregiver, right? They need a break every once in a while. So okay. sometimes you're taking your loved one, you're bringing them to a facility for just a couple of days. So you can go recharge and take a little vacation and, and just, you know, be, you, if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of your loved one. It's going to negatively impact everything about it. So keeping though keeping the holistic process in mind, I think is I think is incredibly important. So yeah, there's that. Well, I can echo the get into a support group. My dad passed away March of 2017. We put mom in the me memory care the same month. That was a fun month. And I went to the hospice grief support, mm -hmm. and I was like. Well, this is great for this one part of my life. Right. But I got this other bigger part. Like, I don't know how to deal with my mother. And this is right. like way worse than I was. Yeah. You know, I mean, I saw them all the time, but it was without my dad as a buffer. Right. Dealing with her was 10 times worse than it had been with him. Right. And so I, like normal people these days, Googled for a support group, found the Alzheimer's Association support group. And as you guys can tell from my background, I am an advocate and I've mm -hmm. done the walk. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the first support group I attended, the first meeting I attended, I felt better about what was going on in my life. And then the second month, I was able to help somebody else. So it was like right. immediately, you know, you're just sort of brought into the group. I still go, although I've it's been virtual and my mom's been gone over a year so. I've missed the last two because I've been doing other things on Thursday nights. <laughs> but, you know, I, I don't need them as much, but I still right. kind of go because they, right. they still kind of want to see me. So yeah. there's definitely a benefit. It's not like a boo-hoo-hoo -hoo fest yeah. or an oh, pity no. me. They help you. You help them. It really is a very nice thing to do. It's very In our group, before we were online, we had meetings with some like 30 people. It was pretty wow, big. Yeah. yeah. Like one night I came home, my husband said, oh, how'd it go? And I'm like, well, there was like 32 people. And he's like, well, wow. that's good. And I'm like, yeah, in one respect, but not so good in another respect. Right, so, right, right. So yeah, definitely. So we're talking to an elder law attorney. We're getting in a support group, mm -hmm. finding out resources through whichever yeah. association is attached to whatever we're dealing with. Okay. So we got them covered. Now, what should those of us, us Gen Xers, some of the older millennials yeah. that are taking care of family, what should we be looking at so that we can 
break this crazy yeah. cycle that is not healthy for anybody. Yeah, I think everyone needs a everyone needs to talk to whether it's an elder law attorney or an estate planning attorney. Everyone needs their own estate plan. We just never know what's going to happen to us. And so, you know, the idea is if we can avoid things like guardianship court and make sure that you are you know, people don't like to think about this stuff because it, of course, brings up our own mortality. And they also think that signing things like a power of attorney or a healthcare surrogate or healthcare proxy designation is giving up control over themselves. And I always tell people, go, you're not. It's an incredibly empowering experience where you choose who gets to help you. Because if you don't, the judge chooses who gets to help you. So uh, there certainly is the potential for abuse. You don't just give out the power of attorney willy nilly. You want it to be with someone who you do indeed trust. And if you don't trust, by the way, there's nothing inherently bad about guardianship or conservatorship. Some people, it makes sense. They go, I want a judge overseeing what somebody's doing. And that makes sense for some people, right? Mm -hmm. But for most people, they go, I'd rather my son, my daughter, my spouse be the one who helps me if I need help for myself. So there's that. And then again, no one knows what tomorrow brings. And just to have a plan in place is um, gives you peace of mind. It gives your family peace of mind. You know, I like to encourage people to think about prepaying for, you know, not, not necessarily the younger millennials, but once you're 60 and over, prepay for your funeral and burial arrangements. Someone's going to have to bear that expense at some point in time, right? So you might as well get it taken care of. That's one less thing for your loved ones to, to, to worry about. And then you're talking to your financial advisors, get that long-term care insurance. Cash is always going to be king, right? Long-term care insurance, even if it's part of a life insurance rider, is better than Medicaid, right? I'm a Medicaid planning attorney and I'm readily you know, admit that, right? We don't know what Medicaid is going to be like in 20 years from now or 30 years from now. So to be able to plan your financial future so you can maintain control over all your decisions and not have to engage in Medicaid planning, always better. And more likely that you'll be able to do it if you plan in advance. So burying your head in the sand uh, <laughs> it has never served anybody. <laughs> Yeah, and if we haven't learned after last year, 2020, yeah. you know, yeah, one day right. we're, you know, my Rotary Club is meeting in person, and then the next yeah. week the governor is saying, that's it, the seven counties that's in right. the San Francisco Bay Area are closed. That's right. That was that was uh, March 16th, and our first Rotary Club online was March 23rd. So, right. you know, I mean, it was just like, all of a sudden, life, it just did a 180 on all of us, and my... Daughter does background checks in the courthouse that she worked out of. Um, it's she's an independent contractor type person. Closed in March of 2020. Yeah. This is June of 2021. It is still closed. We reopen next week. Don't right. know what that means for that particular courthouse. She was basically quote unquote off work for five months, and then the courthouse in Oakland opened, which is right. the main one. I guess it's the main courthouse in that county. And so, you know, here we are still, you know, what is it, 16 months later? I don't know when she's going back to her original yeah. courthouse, if she's yeah. going back. You know, and that's not a big deal in the scheme of life. But it just, you know, I, I try to talk to people. You know, my dad planned. I'm a mm -hmm. planner. Mm -hmm. Last year was hell because you couldn't plan anything. But right. that's okay. <laughs> I survived. Right. But we've talked about, you know, it's just my husband and I and our daughter and almost son-in-law. And we've talked about what do we want to do? You know, do we want to be buried? Do we want to be cremated? Yeah. We want to be turned yeah. into a tree. We want to be mm -hmm. turned into a gemstone. There's like a whole yeah. bunch of crazy options these days. Right, that's true. And, and once you've talked about it, you know, when these new forms of burial or whatever you want to call them come up, you mm -hmm. can just joke about them. Like, you still yeah. want to be a tree? Okay, good, you're a tree. <laughs> you know, it's no big deal. You know, but my family's yeah. a little weird, but, you know, and it's the same thing. We talked to the, we did our estate planning and there were some challenging questions. What if you right. do if if Jennifer comes down with Alzheimer's because my mom had it, my maternal grandmother had vascular dementia, mm -hmm. and my maternal great grandmother had some form of dementia. She died before right. I was born. Not even sure they distinguished back in those days, which makes me sound really old, but <laughs> whatever. You know, ah. and it's like once you get through these tough <laughs> questions, it's like, yeah. oh, okay, well now I have an answer and moving on. Right. Now it's no big deal. It's yeah. really, you know, when he asked us, well, what happens if your daughter goes first? It was like, 
yuck. And it did. It's, we had to think about it for a while. Not that we don't trust the son-in-law, but, you know, it's like, well, what if they do get married and then they get divorced and right. you, know, you start going through all the yeah. what ifs? Yeah. And then, then you sort of decide, he's been in the family for like nine years. Like, what the hell? You know, who else is going to have our money right. if it's not them? So, no. you know, you just you just end up making it just becomes sure. part of your DNA, I guess. Yeah. Like maybe. Yeah. You know, That's, it's, it's really very, very fair. You know, I know my paternal grandma, grandmother who just passed away recently, her husband, my grandfather, he planned everything. I mean, mm-hmm. they had the burial site, everything. Right. Was planned. And right. he tried to talk to her about it. And she's like, la, 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 la. I don't want to hear it. Don't want to uh-huh. talk about it. Uh-huh. And I don't it didn't serve her. Trust me. I'm sure he discussed it with the sons. So it wasn't like that conversation got lost, but it, yeah, we don't really want to talk about what happens after we die, but you know what? You'll be dead. You won't care. Right. <laughs> See, I told you my family's weird. That's funny. That's how we it's roll. It's like, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a valid philosophy. And yeah, it's, it's a lot of people just don't want to think about this and they're going, it's not going to happen to me. And I don't want to think about dying or becoming incapacitated and, um, maybe they'll be fine and uh, maybe they won't, but it's, it's not estate planning is not th- such a burdensome, expensive process that it should prevent anyone from doing it. And by the way, if you don't have a will or you don't, or you're only relying on a will, you're still going to court. Your kids are going to court. Um, so if you don't do it for yourself, you do it for your kids, right? Save them the time, the money of having to hire an attorney. In Florida, it is legally required if you're going through the probate process to hire an attorney to do it. You're not even allowed to try to do it yourself. Um, but guess who wrote the laws? I mean, I didn't write it, but <laughs> yeah. you know, my my colleague wrote it. But but that's what. But you could if you had if you instead you use a revocable trust instead of relying on the will. Now you get to avoid probate altogether. You don't have to hire the attorney to do it. And yet, yeah, getting a trust is a little bit more expensive than just getting a will. But it's again, don't be penny wise and pound foolish. It is worth it in the end. It's a good investment in the end. And talk to an elder. I want to encourage people to talk to an estate planning attorney if they're younger. Talk to an elder law attorney if they're worried about these long-term care expenses, um, because these are real issues that affect many, many Americans. And um, as we get, listen, our healthcare system. Um, well, I guess this is arguable, but it, t- it trends getting better. People are living mm-hmm. longer. But guess what? As we're living longer, now we have more of an opportunity to need assistance with our long-term care because you're not we're not getting older and fitter. We're getting older and just lasting longer. That's what's That's happening. True. Yeah, right? I mean, you know, these are these are real issues that are affecting millions and millions of people. So, I hope I hope your listeners have taken something away from this conversation. Well, if I didn't know that you could do Medicaid planning, mm-hmm. I did know I have talked in the past to like a I don't think they're attorneys. They were they were like a Medicaid planning service. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Oh, don't but do I that. But I didn't get this but I didn't get the same information I got from you. So it's like, okay, more information there, is good. There are um uh, that's that I'm glad you brought that up because there are a lot of these non-attorney services who say they can help you with Medicaid planning. And what happens is they're Well, I can't speak for all of them, but they tend to be one trick ponies, meaning they have they have like an annuity that they're going to try to sell you. And that's all they're going to do. So everything they see is they're going to ask you to buy annuities because there's a way to structure annuities so that they don't count against you for Medicaid purposes. Um, And I go, you're just doing yourself a disservice. And sometimes these firms are venturing into the unlicensed practice of law because they're then they're giving you legal advice when they shouldn't be. So. Um, I, I hope that every, if you're thinking about Medicaid, go see a Medicaid lawyer. It's just, you're going to get the best advice by someone who's been trained, who is licensed to do this stuff, as opposed to, you know, the one, the guy who's just trying to sell you their one product. That makes sense. But Mm -hmm. like I was starting to say, if I've learned something beneficial, especially Mm -hmm. the life insurance with the long-term care rider, then I'm sure everybody listening has gotten... Mm -hmm. Some tidbit 
that they should take advantage of. Yeah. If, if not, at least you've helped me and I'm going to help my friends. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. If it, Self-serving. If, I, if we can touch one person, I'm good with it. I really, I, there's so much bad information about there with Medicaid planning. Again, that's my goal is to try to just get good information. I wrote a book about it just because, again, it's not, you know, the, I, I have this book that goes for $10 on Amazon. It's not a moneymaker. It's I'm just trying to get good information out there. And, uh, and What's the uh, title of the book? Yeah, it's how to get Medicaid to pay for some or all of your long-term care expenses, a little bit of a mouthful, without having to wait five years, without having to sell your house, and without having to go broke first. And that's on Amazon. I'm happy that I can send you a link to that and uh, if, if, if you'd like. And yeah, I try send to me put, the link and I yeah. will throw it in the show notes so other oh, people thanks. can read good information because yeah. you definitely have to counter the bad stuff that's out yeah. there on the internet or the, the well-intentioned also, I, but not good stuff. I write a lot of articles. I post a lot of videos um, on my website, which is elderneedslaw.com. And I try to, again, it's just my effort to try to get good information out there and, and, and educate people. We all had to become like... Uh, media companies too. I know. It's so true. Yeah. I mean, it's really, it really is. I, I mean, I like it. Uh, I mean, it's, a, there's a lot of competition for it, but I like the idea of, you know, the, a lot of lawyers take the philosophy of pay me money and I will solve your problem. And I, my philosophy is I'm going to educate you. I'm going to put out, I put out a lot of free information out there. And if you want my help, I'm happy to provide it. If you're figuring it out on your own, then God bless you. And I'm fine with that too. Okay, so that was elderneedslaw.com. All righty, I wanted to make sure I wrote that down right. Well, thank you very much. This has been very informative. Thank you, Jennifer. You guys have a terrific weekend, and I appreciate all the advice. Thanks so much, and thanks for having me. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.